Welcome to Adapter's Advantage, breakthrough moments that lead to success. Our podcast brings you insider stories of the moments that matter, turning points on the sometimes rocky road to success. Here's your host, Mark Magnaca, president and co-founder of Alego, the workforce training and readiness platform built for distributed teams. Hi, I'm Mark Magnaca, and I want to welcome you to the next episode of the Adapter's Advantage podcast. Today I'm with Frank Cespedes. Frank is a Harvard Business School professor who has an amazing background and in particular has a specialized focus in the realm of sales. So he is a one of the foremost authorities on the topics of sales and sales management. I just want to read a little bit of his official biography to you. So Frank teaches at Harvard Business School. Uh, for 12 years, he was the managing partner at the Center for Executive Development a firm that won awards in the US and Europe for its work with a wide range of companies. He's consulted to companies in many industries and he's been affiliated with private equity and venture capital investors and has been a board member of Austral, Evenflow, GrowthPlay, Halo, and a number of other startup firms. And in particular in the Education for Employment uh, Foundation. At Harvard, he teaches entrepreneurial sales and marketing He heads the executive program on linking strategy and sales and also teaches at the renowned owner president management, also known as OPM for CEOs. He's written uh, for numerous publications, including the Harvard Business Review, California Management Review, the Wall Street Journal. He's written six books and his most current book that will be coming out shortly is called Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing by Harvard Business School Press. So Frank, uh, welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you here. My pleasure, Mark. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to do this with you and with Alego in particular. Well, I wanna call one thing out, Frank, because uh, for some people listening to this, there is a unique element. And, and I know, you know, for, for my alma mater at Babson, uh, one of the things that they really focus on is that the professors have this real world experience. And that's, that's no disrespect to those disciplines whereby working in a research lab in an academic environment, there's absolutely a case for that. But frankly, whether it's archaeology or business, um, there are certain elements of being a professor that really require kind of getting your hands dirty. And, and, and you've done that. So I think I just want our listeners to know that informs a lot of the discussion that we're going to be having here. But there's another piece. It's not just that you have had a business experience that interrupted your academic experience. It's that you've continued to stay at the forefront of what's going on as this business has evolved, literally over the last 30 plus years. So uh, with that, I want to I want to talk to you about something that um, is, is very relevant for the time that we're in. And that is, what do you think is the biggest thing that's changed as a professor at Harvard Business School since the start of the pandemic? Oh, well, the biggest thing is like any other, um, you know, any other um, business or activity that depends on bringing people together, right? I mean, the pandemic has not been an equal opportunity plague. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think CEOs and sales executives have to understand that because um, you know, w- that means something in, re- in uh, recovering from the pandemic. Uh, you know, the single biggest driver of cash in and cash out in a company is the selling cycle, right? Uh, and the reality is that this pandemic has slammed some sectors horribly, generally, service businesses, including education, where people have to come together. Others, you know, some tech businesses, God bless, uh, relatively immune uh, right. from, uh, from the economic impact. And you have to choose. Market's not going to choose for you. You have to choose. Now, in our institution, the big impact has been on the classroom. Uh, you know, this past semester, I've had to teach through a combination of Zoom and the so-called hybrid classroom, uh, and then for executive education, the the OPM program that you mentioned, uh, you have to understand Harvard Business School, Harvard University has a $40 billion endowment, right? The support we get there 
is absolutely superb. I joke about this, but teaching there is the closest thing to Downton Abbey that the, uh, the, the US has to offer. And if you look at the support, the technological support, what has been done in the classroom, it's not the same, but it's 80% of the same. I doubt very, very much if that's true at other institutions that simply don't have that money and those other resources. That, that's yeah. the big, the big that's impact. Actually a really, that's a very good point. And as someone, Frank, who has uh, one son in college uh, and, and a daughter in high school who are both being you know, impacted as, as are the families of so many people listening, um, what's the biggest complaint or challenge that you hear from students about this remote world? Well, in general, uh, you, you've got to distinguish between the pure Zoom classes and what I'm calling the hybrid, and I'll explain the latter. Um, because everybody was taken by surprise by the pandemic, and I think it's important to understand that. I mean, I, I'll give you a personal anecdote that I think gets it across. Uh, I remember the date exactly because um, this has been a leap year, but on February 29th, uh, I was a keynote speaker at a big sales conference, uh, about 1,200 people, no social distancing, and people were simply referring vaguely to this virus in China. Right. Ten days later, everything was shut down. Yeah. So this happened very, very suddenly. All educational institutions, including ours, had to sort of immediately move to Zoom, and it was not very pretty, and the students didn't like it at all. Um, this semester, I think the Zoom uh, support because of experience has gotten a bit better, but the hybrid classroom is different. Half the students are there, half are sort of being beamed in via Zoom on monitors, but there's a different level of interaction. And at least in our institution, that's the big thing for the students. We depend on the case method. We right. depend on that sort of dialogue and no matter what anyone says, Zoom is not set up for this. It's set up for what you and I are doing now. It's a small numbers game that is about dialogue between two people or giving a presentation. It's not set up for how the vast majority of business and sales conversations work. You know, Frank, I, I think that is very well said. That's Both my children would echo that sentiment because um, I've, I've paid very close attention to how it's impacting them. And having sat in your classroom at OPM and, and interacted with your students and watched you in action, I realized that, frankly, so much of the magic is the interaction yeah. that the case study method brings to life. And, and it's not that it can't happen like this, but I do recognize it's, it, it's sort of the, the difference between watching a concert on a DVD or on, on Netflix versus being at the concert. It's, yeah. you know, it's an approximation, but it is not the same experience. Yeah, I, I agree. So, you know, the way I phrase it, it's sort of the difference between a radio play and going to the theater. There you go. There you go. So let's pivot to a, li a little bit on your background and this topic of uh, what was called e-learning that we're, we're really moving under this much broader term now of sales enablement. And a sales enablement, you know, as we think about it, really relates to both uh, the content, the collaboration, and the communication that is all part of the sales process. So in that context, as someone who's you know, really followed this market as it's evolved over time, what's the most important trend you see related to how salespeople will learn going forward? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, first let's step back. What, what any effective training process should do, especially in the sales area, is increase a sales team's productivity, not take net time away from where that productivity does or doesn't happen in interactions with customers in the marketplace. And I think the biggest trend, and this is one where I think the, uh, the pandemic may have a very, very slight uh, civil, uh, uh, silver lining, I think the biggest trend is just in time learning, right? Um, uh, providing salespeople with the content and support they need when and where it matters most. And it matters most for most salespeople 
when they're on their way to make a call or during the actual sales conversation. And I realize, Mark, we're not here to you know, promote anybody's products or firm, but companies like Allego add a tremendous amount of value to that through the technologies that they provide to companies. But again, any technology is only as good as the people who use it. But I think increasingly smart people in sales are understanding that this is where you have an impact on your salespeople's capabilities on the way to and actually during sales conversations. Um, you, I think, uh, from previous discussions we've had, I think you have a very good phrase for this, learning in the flow of work. That's exactly what happens in sales, not the classroom training, but learning in the flow of work. That's the biggest trend I see in e-learning. And again, I think the pandemic has made more and more sales leaders aware of what can be done there, but also what the limitations are. And that I think is a net positive. You know, Frank, that's a very astute analysis because uh, first of all, the learning in the flow of group uh, work uh, phrase, I love that phrase. I owe attribution on that to my previous guest on this podcast, Josh Burson. He is yep. the one who really first coined that phrase. But like you, it just completely resonated with us because it exemplifies how our point of view on the world and, and that journey that you just described. And, you know, Frank, one of the interesting things I'm beginning to hear now as people have gotten over the initial shock and are starting to adapt and they're realizing in many ways, some of the best elements of this virtual experiment, they're going to be with us for a long time to come. It's going to be very tough to justify flying to California for a one hour first discovery meeting for what? Right? Like, why, how can you justify the time and energy and money? So I think elements of this will be with us. But one of the other things that we've realized, uh, we call this the virtual presentation arsenal. And the virtual presentation arsenal is the idea of having all of your important content, your short videos, your PDFs, your white papers. You think of it almost like you preparing for a class, having it all at your fingertips. So to use your experience as an example, at that moment, when a question comes up in the classroom, you have the ability to click and immediately grab another precedent case study, pop it up on the screen. And in that way, sometimes it can actually even make it more effective than when you're in person, because when you're in person, you can't always stop to do that. That's right. So, so we see elements of that buyer's journey of, of what we call the digital sales room. Right, being able to put all this content in a place and let people collaborate, buyer and seller, through the process and have this, this shared space to do so. Yeah. I, I'd actually go a little bit farther than that. I think that's exactly right. But you know, we're living in the age of um, what you know a lot of people like to call big data. You know, I've been hearing that my entire career, right? Uh, we, we, data, 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 it's only gotten bigger. It's a conveniently vague term. The reality is that most organizations do have that data embedded in the organization, but it's fragmented, it's inaccessible. It is in fact exactly the kind of um, platform you're talking about that unlocks that information. I'll give you a quick analogy. I was just reading, I'm a big baseball fan, and I was uh, reading a uh, good book about, uh, you know, the data revolution in baseball. And what this fellow points out is, look, there's always been lots of data in baseball going back a hundred years. Bill James, the great Bill James, made everyone aware of um, what the data does and doesn't tell us over 30 years ago. But it wasn't until major league teams had that data scorecard, and all of them now have it. They have the equivalent of what you're talking about, that one-stop shop platform. Yeah. The Red Sox call their data system Carmine, which I think is wonderful. <laughs> but that's, that's exactly why that data is now able to be applied where it counts, in the field, literally. And that's what Billy Bean had. He started to ask very good questions. Well, let's segue on that point. The, the new book is called Sales Management 
uh, that works, how to sell in a world that never stops changing. And boy, that certainly has, has been true. That title will probably last with us for a while. Um, what do our listeners need to know uh, both about these new sales realities and in particular, um, what's the impact on sales management? Uh, which I, th I think is a topic that um, is of great interest to many of the people listening to this podcast. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, my book starts from a premise, which I think is a very, very good and solid premise. And that is the most important thing about selling in any business is the buyer and the buying process. All right. So you start uh, on the demand side, not uh, the supply side. And that's the big change, the change in the buying process in many, many uh, industries. Now, historically, and this goes back about 60, 70 years, but I'm going to get academic uh, just for a moment, Mark, but historically, the way most sales organizations think about buying and the way they therefore configure their selling efforts is what academics call a hierarchy of effects model. In other words, how do you move a prospect from awareness to interest to desire to action? It's called the AIDA yep. model. And that model is the basis, very often the unconscious basis for sales efforts in most companies. It's why most talk about sales, I would argue about 98% of the talk is dominated by the so-called pipeline yeah. funnel metrics. Yeah. That is not true to buying. Increasingly, it's untrue. And the reason is technology, right? Buyers now are a click away from product and price comparisons. They don't simply go through a sequential funnel. They go through parallel streams of activity online, offline, back online, offline, et cetera. And that's a big deal. It has significant impacts on sales management. And, you know, academics, we love alliteration. Uh, the impacts that I talk about in my book are first about people. This affects hiring, who you hire, how you train and develop them how you socialize and deploy salespeople. It affects process, uh, you know, many, many sales models. Uh, what, what I think uh, the new buying uh, exposes is the loose screws in many, many sales models. So how do you construct and then reconstruct a coherent sales model? Pricing, and by the way, there's a lot of myths about what technology means by pricing. The net result, and I think I document this with lots of data in the book, the net result is that it uh, uh, opens up more opportunities, not fewer, more opportunities for value pricing. Partners, it is an omni-channel buying world that demands a multi-channel selling response. Too many organizations are still wasting time and energy in these silly Oxford debates should we be online? Should we be personal selling? The answer is yes, all right? But then all the uh, sales management wisdom is how we configure those things. And then my fifth P is productivity. And um, here what I'm talking about is what senior executives don't know increasingly about uh, their customer facing colleagues and why that's a big deal and not only a deal for shareholders. If you look at the number of people who make their living in sales, if you look at the importance of economic growth in service economies, getting your sales force to be more productive is not only something you wanna do for share price, it is a social responsibility of management. The, the biggest paradigm shift, and I wanna make sure it's not lost on anybody, you just said, that the shift to a buying journey, the, 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 the point of view, thinking of it from the buyer's perspective is completely different than trying to force fit buyers into these artificial stages that we've created. I know we've got to have some framework to measure things, but it, it's a very important exercise to keep asking yourself the question. Um, I, I, read, I read recently, Frank, about Elon Musk 
and he was talking about uh, a lot of different things, but in particular, this one about CEOs um, not being out on, on the, the shop floor, so to speak, like being too disconnected. And all I can tell you is you need only, and this is five years ago, you need only have seen the Tesla app that allowed you to open the doors remotely to your car. It allowed you to start your car. In his case, it allowed you to drive the car, you know, bring the car over to you, right? It had all of these components. Once you start using an app, you, you ask yourself the question, why doesn't every other car have an app? Now, here we are in 2020. They're just now getting it. But that kind of delay speaks to that like old Detroit-centric mindset of, we're GM, we'll tell you how it is. You're not going to tell us. Yeah, yeah, but I, 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 I agree with you entirely. The way I like to phrase that is, look, it is not, you know, it's not the market's responsibility to be kind to your sales strategy. It's your responsibility to adapt sales to what the market is. But think about what the pandemic, uh, I think, has demonstrated uh, to um, smart sales leaders and uh, others in the organization, all right? And, and I think people misunderstand this, and I think the, uh, the press, the way it talks about this, misunderstands it. Salespeople have never wanted to fly to a customer, stay in a hotel, spend that time because they enjoy flying and staying in hotels. As you know, that gets old in yeah. a hurry. Friday afternoon at O'Hare for any salesperson. Oh, fun, <laughs> fun, fun. They do it because they quite rightly fear that if they don't, yeah. a competitor will, yep. and that will give them an advantage. Now, notice what the pandemic has demonstrated to us and not demonstrated. What I don't think it's demonstrated is there's going to be a wholesale uh, transfer of um, e-commerce and online selling for personal selling. I, I just don't think those, you know, these straight line extrapolations that you read about uh, are, you know, nonsense in my opinion. But what they have demonstrated is what you can do virtually. And in turn, they've shown smart executives that in many, many of their sales models, they are in effect overpaying for certain stages of customer conversion. They're sending expensive resources in where you can do it for a 10th of the cost. In other ways, you can then allocate those expensive resources to those areas where they do have impact and notice what happens when you increase productivity that way. You're not only getting more from less, you're usually in most businesses also increasing your total addressable market. In other words, segments that were uneconomic for you to reach can now be reached. That I think is the real impact of virtual sales. There's gonna be many, many hybrid models that quite cleverly use this. It's not either or, it's how do we do both in an omni-channel buying world. The vast majority of salespeople spend significantly less than 50% of their time in actual customer contact. And by customer contact, I don't simply mean, you know, making a pitch. I mean, all customer contact, emails, webinars, Zoom, whatever it is. The data suggests that across industries, but obviously it varies, on average, it's about 33%, about a third of their time. Notice what happens if you can make 33%, 38%, 45%. In most businesses, that is a huge business impact. And that I think is you know, where we're going as a result uh, of this experience. And that's a good thing. Let, let's pivot to just another chapter in the book where you specifically focus on training and development. And you describe the fact that US companies spend 20% more on training salespeople than any other function. And yet the results are disappointing. What's one thing that people can do who are listening here to improve on that stat? Well, I mean, you know, first, let me get back to something we were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, the problem with most sales training is that it misunderstands how adults 
learn, and in particular, how salespeople learn. Um, they don't learn, for the most part, in classrooms. There's lots and lots of research uh, about this. All right, once you're on the job, classroom training has um, a, a positive but limited impact. And as you know, you and I have actually written about this. Uh, most people, and sale, busy salespeople in particular, they just forget about 80 to 90 percent of what they were, what they heard in the classroom. You know, 60 to 90 days later, there is that's corporate uh, short termism. Um, they learn in specific task-oriented situations. That's the way adults learn. They learn for a purpose. They don't learn to take the final exam as they do uh, in class. In addition, and this is particularly true and documented in the sales area, the effects of learning in sales are cumulative, right? Uh, and the reason is that salespeople are a classic example of what the academics in this area call modeling behavior. Right. The way most salespeople learn is not from you and me. They learn by watching their peers, the best of their peers. And they basically say, hey, that was a clever way you gave that pitch. I hadn't thought about that way of answering an objection, et cetera. So the one thing that companies can do to improve their, uh, their training processes is pay attention to establishing processes and tools that encourage more of this peer learning and make it easier uh, to do. Uh, and by the way, I think this is more important uh, because of the buying changes that uh, we discussed uh, just a few moments ago. Customers now have the tools to do that, right? And it's not just, you know, I go to the uh, web and I compare price and product. Think about B2B markets where you now have all of these customer forums from um, Marketo, Power Review, Salesforce. You mentioned salesforce.com earlier. They have it. There they're getting unedited uh, experiences from other customers about price, product, service, et cetera. Uh, salespeople need these tools and processes to up their game. That, whatever else, is what sales training should be doing. And I think it's beginning to do that as platforms from companies like yours are allowing smart people to use these things productively. How do you see technology platforms, whether it's Allegro or other things, um, being used to help reinforce content, content from books, content from classrooms? How do you see that happening going forward? Well, I think the, the important thing here is, um, is the following. I, want, I just wanna talk about two, um, two empirical facts about almost every Salesforce in the world. Empirical fact number one is that it's a heterogeneous group, all right? People learn in different ways. Some people will learn by simply getting online and listening to the module about X, Y, or Z. Others are going to learn through that modeling behavior that I talked about earlier. There are some people for whom video is absolutely essential, and there are others that love the checklists, et cetera. So number one impact of that is you're not going to do root canal on somebody's genetic inheritance. Right. You've got to provide tools that can uh, uh, speak to this. The other thing is that sales in particular, the, the, again, the, the, the data about this is not only in my book, I'm, I'm citing other people's data there, but sale, the, in sales in particular, the, the variance in individual performance is much, much wider than it is in almost any other business function. The point is that, think about this, the top 10 to 20% of salespeople, the top quintile yep. of salespeople in most sales forces are not just a little bit better than the average in that sales force, the data says they're usually a heck of a lot better. They're typically selling five to 10 times the amount that the average 
rep is. So the other thing is, how do we, you know, it's like when Harry met Sally, I'll have what she's having, <laughs> right? How do we tap that best practice? That I think is what these processes and tools allow you to do. But again, you know, uh, the, the fundamental truth about technology, as you know, Mark, is garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Uh, it's only as good as the information and the people who are managing this. But right now, technology should be the seller's friend. It's increasingly user friendly. The issue is, do we know why we're using it? Do we know the sales tasks that we need to focus on given the changes in buying in our marketplace? And that's ultimately a management issue. It is not a software or data issue. Well, you know, you make a really interesting point here, Frank, because when I think about the peer-based learning model, and I think about what you just described, which is this persistent reality of the 80-20 rule that yeah. the Italian economist Pareto came up with, you know, more than 100 years ago. And the fact that it persists, that it demonstrates that this 20% roughly, or the quintile um, of, the, of the top quarter, disproportionately can outsell everybody else. And that has persisted over so long. If, if you think most people go to work and they want to succeed, the idea of creating a culture that instead of a bunch of lone wolves, you, you recognize that with this team selling mindset, if I, there may be just one nuance that either A, I can pick up from understanding what you're doing differently, or B, that my sales manager can help me notice that's a blind spot for me, right? That what, what we're seeing is that sometimes there are people who are subject matter experts within the sale, selling team they are themselves not the top performer, but they are the most knowledgeable on a particular topic. So when you aggregate all this, you have the one plus one equals three effect. Yeah. And so we're, we're finding the ability to, A, leverage that top 20% and do so in a way that like at a national sales meeting, they're up on stage, they're telling the story, they're being interviewed. That's, that's one uh, element to this. But the other element is instead of just what we call the usual suspects there, we're able to broaden this and recognize there may be younger salespeople who are not necessarily in the top 20% yet, but the way they're using technology is so innovative that the top 20% who may be older need to learn from. Yeah, but you see, for me, that's, um, that's, that's what sales managers get paid to do. They get paid to manage. And if you look in most sales organizations, Mark, the main conduit for doing what you just said recognizing what is that good practice? How do I bring it to the relevant person? The newbie who can learn from the senior rep or the senior rep who can learn from what the newbie's doing because of their familiarity with tech. The major conduit for doing that in most organizations is performance reviews. Right. And in my experience, performance reviews are by and large the most underutilized lever for affecting behavior in most organizations and particularly in sales. And I think this is something companies need to recognize as they try to restart their business over the pandemic. Get your frontline sales managers, A, to take performance reviews seriously and do them well. And by the way, this is a trainable skill. This is not metaphysics. Company I ran, I waited five years before we did training about that. And I, that was five years too long. And notice why this is important. Most, you know, a market never buys anything. Only individual customers buy. Right. And many, much of that relevant information is locked, you know, in the head of the individual rep. It only becomes apparent in performance reviews. So when sales managers do sloppy performance reviews, you know, quickie reviews that are really about compensation, not about uh, performance um, uh, development, they're doing two things. They're perpetuating a culture of underperformance, but equally important, they're inhibiting the flow of vital information for the rest of yeah. the organization. So, you know, again, I agree with everything you're saying, but we can't let sales managers off the hook. Sales managers must manage, and in particular, do performance reviews well. Frank, as we get ready to wrap up, I always like to just end with a question 
uh, that really relates to the title of this podcast, The Adapter's Advantage. And you know, you, you talked about getting lucky with your first business. My suspicion is that may be true, but there also, um, there's probably a lot that went into it that to make it work during that time with, with you and, and your other managing partners. Um, so the question is, what's the biggest personal or professional challenge that you've had to adapt to in your professional career? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, let me, um, um, your point about luck, I, I think uh, I think you phrased it well. You mentioned this um, uh, owner, president, manager program that I teach in. Um, and I joke with them, but it's a joke that has a lot of truth. They're, they're exactly the opposite of our MBAs. Mm -hmm. Analytically, these are all successful small business people. Analytically, they can't hold a candle to the typical Harvard MBA, but they're very, very street smart. Right. Secondly, they're very irreverent. Um, the typical MBA student, in my opinion, is excessively respectful of his or her professor because we grade on a forced curve. <laughs> uh, we, we don't grade the OPMs. Their basic attitude, and you can smell it when you walk in the room, their basic attitude is, hey, Frank, if you're so smart, how come I'm richer than you are? <laughs> exactly. So I, I, you know, I, um, I, sort of, uh, I sort of like that attitude. But I mentioned this to an OPMer last year. You know, I said, no, I got lucky. And he made a comment that I think um, was very wise. I hadn't thought of it this way. And he said, you know, remember, Frank, if you're going to get hit by lightning, first, you got to be outside. You can see what he was getting at. Yeah. Right? I think, you know, this gets me back to the uh, adaptation question you're asking. The other thing that's good about your technology at Oligo and others that are, are there, it does allow companies to test before they invest big time. It does allow them to do lots of experimentations with a heterogeneous sales force that needs to have a multi-channel capability. So I think that's one of the um, single biggest things you can do to adapt. Frank, um, it's just such a pleasure to connect with you on this wide range of topics. Um, for people who want to learn more about you or want to be able to buy this book or, or any of the other books, what's the best way for them to find you? Well, the, uh, to buy the book, you can go to Amazon, you can pre-order now, the book will be available uh, physically uh, and uh, through ebook in mid February. Uh, you can go to Harvard Business Press. They are the publisher, and you know you want it for your entire sales force, obviously. And they offer bulk discounts. Uh, you can go to my website, franksespedes.com. Uh, uh, and I also hope, Mark, I'll send you anything you need. I also hope that there's a way that you uh, can uh, let people know how to order the book uh, via this podcast as well. I'll be happy to do that, Frank. We can list uh, the, a link in, in the notes once we get this published. So thank you again. I really appreciate uh, the relationship. I appreciate being able to learn from you. And I appreciate uh, having you as a brainstorming partner for my co-founder and I uh, as we think about adapting in this marketplace. Well, my pleasure. And let me just say, I wanna, I'll, I'll conclude by saying something. A guest in one of my classes said, um, last month. Stay positive, test negative. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Adapters Advantage, available on all major podcast platforms. Make sure you visit our website, alego.com, where you can subscribe to our podcast so you'll never miss an episode. If you liked this show, you might want to check out our virtual training kit to learn how to keep a remote team running at full speed. Go to alego.com slash virtual to download your kit today. Be sure to tune in for our next episode. And don't forget, one new idea can change your life.